It was never just another swim, another sporting event. It was an emblem of living to the nth degree. Nobody had swum 50 miles in the open ocean yet. And I got all the nautical charts of the Earth's surface on my floor of Manhattan, my Manhattan apartment, and I threw out, you know, the Antarctic Circle in unrealistic places. And when my eyes swept across Cuba, my heart stopped. It is Mother Nature raging on steroids. We couldn't, if we had all the nautical charts of the Earth's surface on this stage tonight, we couldn't find a more taxing swim for a swimmer than the Florida Straits between Cuba and Florida. If you're facing the map where you are, you're trying to swim over 100 miles from Havana due north, but you can't swim due north because over here, Screeching and squeezing out of the Yucatan Channel is the mighty Gulf Stream, the most powerful current in all of the world's oceans. And right above Cuba, that stream is flowing hard east, and it's going five to six times anybody's swimming speed. Michael Phelps, much less mine. Within that Gulf Stream, which some days, if this is Key West here and this is Havana down here, that Gulf Stream is fat. It's so wide, it takes up 90 of the 100 miles, and all of those 90 miles of current are going east. Every time you stop by your boat, Bonnie, my head handlers, it's an expedition. You have 44 people, the shark team, the jellyfish team, the navigation team, the medical team, the team on other boats to support the epicenter right here on this boat. I can swim over close to the boat. I tread water. I can never touch the boat, grab onto the boat, touch the kayaks out here that have the electronic shark shields underneath them, creating an elliptical field of electricity that most sharks don't like to come through. But as shark experts will tell you, 50, 60 miles offshore, shark hasn't eaten in a week or two, and an innocent little swimmer goes by creating a low frequency vibration on the surface, that shark will come right up and then they will reassure you also and say that, you know, sharks are intelligent. They know the homo sapien is not their food. They don't want to eat you. They will not eat you. Yes, they'll come up and take a leg um, or a big section of your thorax, but they're, they're not going to take you whole. It's, it's so heartening, you know, to hear that, that kind of news. So every time you're over close to the boat getting some sustenance, taking in an electrolyte drink with a camelback hose or, or listening to Bonnie, she's got some crucial information to tell you. We're going to have to pick up speed for the next three miles because the current is really jagging us south a little bit. You're treading water. And when you tread water, you're being dragged to the east. And when you're in crisis, which you are, you're at hypothermia, you're immersed in a liquid 12 to 15 degrees colder than your body temperature. After 30, 40, 50 hours, you're going to feel cold. You're in the middle of hallucinations. I got all swept up in the Taj Mahal over here. Grand, really. But Bonnie's not happy because if I'm not focused and I'm watching the Taj Mahal with the pillars, just incredible, <laughs> and not going forward and northing, north, we are going east, and if you're in one of these crises, extreme shoulder pain, you're, you're very upset to the stomach in the salt water after a while, now you're dealing with the team. You're not out, but you're treading water, and the med team, or your Bonnie and her team are dealing with you. Now you're stopping for not just 90 seconds, you're stopping perhaps for 17 minutes, and you're going east and east and east, and pretty soon, this 100 miles over here has become over here a vector of 130 or perhaps 150, and the whole thing becomes untenable. You feel it. If you just don't give up, if you don't quit, you'll get there. The second thing I said was, you're never too old to chase your dreams. <laughs>